So the guys, welcome back to Times with Shine and Valerius. Hello, Valerius. Hello, everyone. Hello, and pause the dips fills. Right. Wow. Instant sneezing. <laughs> I used to hear fever. Like, started town, sneeze time. Yeah, we're getting back to that sort of time of year, Valerius. I've got um, some pills I'm going to be taking, but I'm just, oh, I'm so worried about taking them. Pills here. It's the, um, you know, herbal remedy, uh, rem remedies. Herbal uh, remedy. Yeah. Herbal remedies and such, right? Yeah. Um, I've got some now that contain all types of fucking pollen. Okay. So you take it and it slowly makes your immune system realise what pollen is and get you better at it. I see. But it means I've got to take it for like two whole weeks wow. and just be dead for two weeks. <laughs> and it's like, it's that commitment of, do I really want to be dead for two weeks? Well, but if not, do you want to like, you well, know? Oh, yeah. The thing is, all over hair fever medicine, for me, kind of like, it quells it, but it never like makes you go away. Quell. It's always there. Yeah. It's... It slows it down and it's like infinite evilness that he does. Right, while well, the Tannies do that, Craig Gamosol wants us to continue with the auto-equipping... Are you sure? Because I'm not supposed to be anything, is there? That was the wrong button. Uh, no, the bast... The bastards the of the beliefs. The bastards yeah. are all locked away, Valerius. I wish I always didn't accidentally find one at some point. Um, yes, I'm sure. Okay. I'm going to trust so, you. But if one of our people turns into bears, I'm going to have to stab you in the dick. There we go. Clicked a few of them. We'll see how they go. Oh, there's an instant fucking siege. Yeah. Well, I don't think we had one last time, did we? Oh, that's a small one. Um, we were making weapons and such, though. Um, we could continue making the fucking bone weapons to get them out there's, of the way. There's a bunch of stuff here which hopefully people yeah. are going to start putting on. Um, Why is that person got to carry in the armoury? <laughs> they were just in the armoury, right? They walked to an armoury rack and suddenly had a cow. <laughs> As if they went to go equip and then was like, oh, oh good cow. Oh, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so I'm going to go put my armor on. Yeah. <laughs> Why have I still got this cow on my head? <laughs> Basically, they just stopped that cow. Well, um, he said that we could maybe stop producing food temporarily while they eat through some of the meat and clear it up, but that sounds like really dangerous. It's a dangerous idea. The thing was that um, struggled us with meat was the fact that we have that order now for pigs. To get a thousand meat, mm. and as you can see, they've started clearing quite a bit of it up every now and then. Well, with some of it should be in these barrels. Oh yeah, they'll be. Oh yeah, this in is there, yeah. this is full of chicken. Shouldn't we just make some more barrels in here, maybe for the? Um... Um, well, I don't think we want to switch on to them just yet, because the thing we need barrels for next is cows. And yeah, but I'm thinking how the cows doing. We could get all this raw pork and beef like in barrels in here. I think it is, isn't it? No, this is all raw poultry. Huge so we haven't got any barrels for pork? No. Oh god, we will have to do that then, because we put in an acid order So, for it. it'll also use up some of the wood, is what I'm yeah. thinking. So, um... Best to just do it. I'll get right on that. Point. I, the other day, right, was playing, um... You know I've been playing that game recently, the airport thing. Uh, Sim airport. Yeah, like airport management simulator. Yeah, I don't know if they added this in an update or something, but I was sat there, Oops. and when you create roles, you have to do it one by one. And I mean... It's really a massive ball, like, doing it one by one. Then suddenly, like, yesterday, I was just, like, clicking. I accidentally dragged it, and it made more road. And I was like, oh, my God, it did not do that before. I tried that before, and it didn't do it. Oh, it was so good. Yeah, it I've, everything. I've seen you playing that. It's like, <laughs> it looks like it gets very chaotic very fast. Oh, yeah. The main thing, as I keep saying, is, like, because there's a lot of people going on planes, that, like, it fills up fast, and you've got to remember, there's people coming off the planes. So when it goes like this plane needs 300 passengers, it's 300 passengers and 300 being dropped off. So you then have 600 people running around your airport frantically. Yeah. So if you get two planes with 300 in each, then you're looking at like 1,200 people instantly in your airport running around. And obviously, once you start getting that many people, they start making a lot of mistakes. One of the things that's really annoying, as happens with fucking towns, is the rest and eating. Where if they get to the airport, they won't be full on rest and eating. So they get the idea in their head of, hey, I'll just go over here and go in the vending machine, rather than going for security and going in the vending machine in the gate. Which should take priority. It should. They also changed it now as well, though. So if the plane is full, you know, if it gets everyone on there, it could just leave. That's quite nice. Because before, it still waited till its time and then flew off, even if it was full. Which makes a lot more sense. Like, if it's got everyone on there and it's like 20 minutes early, it could just fly off. I just like the fact that there was that one guy who went to the bathroom and forgot to wash his hands. There's so many of them. And then went back to wash his hands afterwards. That's the one, pretty funny. The one enjoyment of this game now that I've found is like following people is one of the best things ever. Because you get to see like 
how their little brains work. <laughs> like, I followed that first class person who went past basically all the quick first class desks to the slowest one, went and queued up for absolutely ages, got through, went into gate one, sat down, got out, went into the bathroom, had a piss and everything, went back to gate one, got up, went out of gate one into gate two, had to sit down, got up, got out of gate two into gate three, and then was like, oh, I better queue up for my plane that's coming in there five seconds. Because they spent all that time just sitting in every single fucking gate they went in. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple more barrels to do. The annoying thing I find is the foundations are very weird. Um, when you build, obviously when you build a foundation, if you build it over an existing wall, they'll break that wall. However, if you build it over, like, let's say in front of that wall, so it's like connected to it, mm. they still build the wall there. So then you have two walls. Next to each other. Right. And it's like, that's quite annoying, because you've then got to break down the wall. Break the walls <laughs> down! you got to break the chain. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you'll never break the chain, John. Classic fucking wrestling songs. Oh my god. Oh my god. you got to break the walls down. There's a Twitter account, I don't know if you've seen it, called Wrestling Without Context. No. And it's like, have you seen the Louis Theroux Without Context? The No, no Context Louis? I think so, ages ago. And it's like it's got Louis on the floor shouting, I'm a Beatle, sir! Yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. Well, there's a wrestling without context, and it's just got, like, the weirdest sort of, like, still images from uh, from wrestling and stuff. And there was one they put up the other day, and it's like, it must have been some sort of ladders match. So there's, like, eight sets of ladders, like, set up in the ring. Yeah. But they're all stood on top of them, the various wrestlers. Like, having just some sort of conversation is really <laughs> strange. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Oh, not too bad. Just getting this belt. <laughs> it's so weird. How's the wife at home? Oh, she's not too bad. Wants me to win this uh, title match. It's like there's a lot from like Japanese wrestling as well, which must be like just fucking insane. Because there's like oh, man, there's a guy really like, driving a little like go kart around. <laughs> I bet that's really fun to watch. <laughs> oh man, fucking wrestling! <laughs> it used to be so good. <laughs> Everything used to be so good. Everything, yeah, everything, was everything was better when you were younger. Yeah. That's like just the, the golden rule of life, isn't it? Well, everything's it? better when you're younger because everything seems so amazing. You don't have any kind of like responsibilities. Well, yeah, actually, Ben and Tom were talking about this yeah. on the Jerkoff stream when um, they were talking about Red Dwarf. And Ben yeah. says um, basically when he was little, he thought Lister was like the coolest guy ever, yeah. sort of thing. And it wasn't until he got older that he was like, oh my god, this guy is like the worst guy ever. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's but, like you do have different sense of perception, don't you? Well, it's also based around the fact that you don't have like any commitments as well. Yeah. Like as a child, you don't have to like pay your taxes and do all this and everything. It's all handled to you by your parents, nice and simple. Uh, so it's like when you get older, you start having you know issues with all that, and then uh, you lose all that magic. You lose all the magic due to taxes. Exactly. <laughs> it's like nothing worse well, than taxes. There's taxes, there's bills, there's getting a job, there's getting an income, there's managing your life. It's because it's just all, your, all pension, your free time house, just drifts away, doesn't it? Well, it's because once you get older, it's like... As a kid, the days are like almost no, endless. There's no early progression. You know. That's the thing. There's no kind of like progression. It's like, oh, you just uh, you finished your education? Well, go get a job, get a house, get married, yeah, get a yeah. car. It's like, oh, please. That's true, yeah. It it's, is like, like, it's not a case of... Straight in the deep end. It's not a case of while you're at school, they go, okay, so uh, we're going to give you all a part-time job uh, that will teach you how to get yeah, and the, look after things. The only real preparation yeah. is you get like work experience where it's like, yeah, okay... Two you're, weeks work experience. You're going to go work somewhere for two weeks. And usually in the United Kingdom, because you're 16... It's like they don't want to give you anything strenuous. Yeah, yeah. So then for those two weeks, you probably just like play Game Boy in the back of a butcher's. Yeah, It's much. like, it's really kind of shitty. I mean, I actually did shit for my fucking work experience. I went out and fucking did everything that I was meant to. It was well cool. Where did you do yours? Funeral directing. Oh, yeah, you did, didn't I, you? I carried bodies. Cool. I saw the entire embalming process. Oh, I could tell you stories of the <laughs> fun I had. <laughs> But admittedly, like, you know, back then I kind of liked the idea. Yeah, it's, so, well, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? It's, it something... it's an interesting thing that not many people get into. Yeah. Not only that, but you get a fucking nice early retirement. If, <laughs> if you're going to do it, you might as well do it. It's something that's, you know... Plus, it's like, you know... Cause I... It's the one job where you're always going to need them. Yeah, I did mine in a bank, which yeah. was like... It wasn't that interesting, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, at the time, it seems like quite interesting because you're managing loads of money and such. But then you realise afterwards, but you were not. Yeah, <laughs> you, it's not okay. I didn't serve anyone or handle any money and stuff like that because you can't because yeah. there's you know various security bullshit that you'd have to go through. Well, that's what I had to, to do, do when, um, when I, I, I got to see a lot of the behind the scenes yeah. and stuff. And but you, you can't know. tell anyone. 
Because it's like, when I went to mine, everyone was like, oh, what did you do? I bet it was really yeah, weird. I was yeah, like, well, yeah. I can't tell you anyone because they sign you to secrecy because obviously it's people's, like, exactly. lives that you're dealing with. It's, I mean, I, well, you know, I can, the depths. You, can, you can talk about some sort of it, bits of it, but it's like you can't discuss the procedures and stuff like that. Yeah, pretty much. So it's like I can't tell you what the security procedures were that allow you into the vault or anything like that, you know what The I mean? one thing that I can say is that once you, like, do pass on, if you get a good few of directors, mm. they look after you lovely. Like, they'll di- oh. try and do everything to make that kind of transition, like, quite nice. To be honest, it's like, it's one of those things where if you're handling any sort of sensitive information these days, they, they do slap you with the official secrets yeah. act. It's like, even my job now, I, I'm bound by the official secrets act, so there's only so much I can say. I can discuss, like, you know, because I work in a post office, yeah. I can discuss, like, you know, the process, processes behind, you know, the mail and how that works and the postal system and stuff like that. But I can't tell you how we secure the money on the premises or what sort of values of money well, are handled and stuff like that. That's just general stuff, really. Isn't mm. it? I mean, no one would ever go, oh, just tell them all we keep it in uh, the safe in the back. <laughs> exactly. But it is a little <laughs> bit annoying because it's like, also, like, when I went for this job, one of the things I, I said was, like, I'm obviously used to handling large sums of yeah. money from my previous job. And I was, like, able to say, because that wasn't a job bound by the Official Secrets Act, I was able to say, you know, generally... It's not unusual for me to handle sums between three and ten grand in a day for that yeah. job, um, you know, in actual cash. So it's like you're responsible for that sort of sum of money. Now, obviously, post office is, is a larger sum, but when I go for my next job, all I can say is I've worked with larger sums of money than that, but I can't give you a sort of figure. <laughs> so if I was to go yeah. for, a, for a bank, I'd have to say, you know, I've worked with the kind of sums I've worked that with are sums in excess in post of office. ten grand, but that's well, it. I suppose you'd have to say that are usual in a post office because being yeah, yeah. a bank, they probably would know kind of like yeah, because I'd money imagine low in quite a lot of businesses. Yeah. But if you were to go into like say a small retail shop, they would have no fucking clue. And They'd it be is like, you'd, you'd be su- you, you would be surprised. Do you know what I mean? It's like you'd, yeah, because people think of the post office just as like to deal with posting stuff, and it's not just that as well. We do deal with a lot of banking and stuff like that. I can say one of the jobs of funeral directing that fucking sucks was washing the limo. Yeah. Oh god, that sucks because it is the case of it's not just washing it; it is. Spotless. It's got to look good. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, got to be it the cleanest you've ever seen it in all this business. Mm. And it's like usually you're out there with um, one of the people that usually drives it, and he has to quickly test the limo, make sure it's all running and everything. And if there's yeah, even just yeah. the slightest issue with like if it sounds wrong or something, straight away in the garage, everything. Yeah, yeah, because you don't Every, want it breaking down. Yeah, everything is like a hundred percent amazing inside your directors. It's all nice and pristine. It's like they always work with the best materials. They haven't moved any of this pork yet. The one thing as well that um, I noticed was they read a lot of funeral director magazines. Did not even know that was a thing until I worked there. Well, pretty much every sort of business has has a like magazine. internal magazines and stuff. Yeah, but this it's was like kind of... we used to watch that show. Have I got news for you? Where they used to like you know get those guest yeah. publications in. It'd be something bizarre, like you know, uh, engineering monthly or like yeah. you know, phone case supplement magazine. You think who who buys this? And it's like. The industry. It's, yeah. it's industry press. It is weird as hell. And there's so many of them, and they're, some of them are weird. Because it's like, some of the funeral director magazines were made by other funeral directors. Mm. They would have their names stamped on it and such, and it would just have, like, generic things that you can say. Yeah, yeah. And things you can't, and that business. Well, we, we you know, obviously Post Office has its own internal yeah. magazine as well. Yeah. When, I, when I worked in, in retail, it was like, there's quite a lot of retail magazines, and they send you all sorts of them. And there's um, there's even, like um, like... Ones that are specifically targeted at Asian shopkeepers yeah. because there's a lot of them. Um, so it was like you'll you'll get like um, it'll be dealing with like independent products and stuff like that that they normally get through their supply chain and like ethnic foods and stuff like that. And then there'd always be like sections in the back that are just in Urdu. Yeah, and it's like they send you this out. You look at it and you think I can't read Urdu. <laughs> this is no. Why are you sending us this? Well, um, the other thing was like because obviously I was young when I did this work experience. It was like the guy who actually like had me on board didn't want me like doing nothing at any point. Mm. So when it was kind of like a calm day where you could have a little bit of a sit down and such, one of the things that I did do was read up about old funeral directors. He had like all the old papers and things, you know, from like old times and such. Yeah, yeah. I kind of used like, to. Um, well, one of the interesting ones was the kind of bell method, you know, for the really old kind of medieval times mm. of when they weren't hundred percent sure if people were dead, they would put the string down there with the bell. Yeah, and then yeah. the grave guy would sit there and like. If you heard a bell ringing, quickly dig up the fucking grave as fast as he could. <laughs> but it was like, he used to like, basically, after I read it, it was like, now imagine 
if um, it was a windy night, yeah, you yeah, there yeah. And just every single bell is chiming. You'd be like, oh god, I'm gonna dig everyone up. <laughs> the zombie apocalypse has happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's finally come true. Oh, man. Yeah, we had some weird methods in the past for kind of like trying to this, get past this things. Thing, this is what I love about the past of Valerius. Yeah. Because like the, I've always loved sort of medieval fantasy more than like yeah. science fiction or anything like that. Because I just love the sort of low tech world and stuff, which is why I'm bloody loving like getting back mm. into D&D recently. And it's like just trying to like think about things like that. Like you say, like, uh, yeah. you know, you come across something you're like, oh shit, how would this be handled back then? You know what I mean? Well... The way that they kind of handled it, you know, the bell method, the reason why they did that was they could obviously keep the body outside mm. and see if it wakes up. However, the body will start to smell if it is actually dead. Yeah, so yeah. you want to get it in the ground. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So it's that kind of well, hardship this is... of it does have to go in the ground, but if it is alive... This is the thing in D&D, there's a cleric spell called Gentle Repose that stops bodies rotting, mm. which is, like, quite handy if you've got a hold someone. Because, like, if one of my players dies, they're, like, three days from town, from the nearest cleric that can yeah. raise dead. You know what I mean? It's like they've got to drag that body for three days back to town, you know. And, that, and that's just like at the area they're in now. If they end up somewhere more isolated, it could take them weeks to get back until they level up and get like, you know, ways of travelling faster, like teleports or horses or something like or that. Or equip. Oh, yeah. I'm, <laughs> Good day, I'm, I'm, well, I'm trying to... I want them to start putting some of this pork away, but they're a bit busy on the wall. There we go. So, yeah, I, I mean, like, one of the things I'm doing is I'm setting up this ambush in a sawmill yeah, and I was like, at first I was like, it just came to me, and I was like, oh, this would be great, you know what I mean? Because we'll have like uh, an area above where the archers can be hidden behind and stuff, and it's like you know quite low light because there's yeah. not many windows in there. It's not an in use sawmill; it's like abandoned, so the windows are all like grubbed over and stuff. Um, but uh, the idea, the the concept behind it is that players know the ambush is there; they go in there to sort of counter ambush. Yeah, um, so they're going to have to find. That they're gonna have to make a plan up if, unless they're just gonna charge at the door and just like trigger it all. But um, th- but then I was like, oh shit, would they even have sawmills back then? I'm like, well, obviously they would have sawed wood. Would they have had a whole mill for it? And then I was trying like, and it ended up on Wikipedia, YouTube, like yeah. researching like when were sawmills invented and stuff like that, and like you know how would they have powered the saws and all I this? Ma- I would have imagined it would have been more of a like logging hatch kind of thing, like you know, a big mm. building with loads of people that sit there sawing the wood all yeah, day, yeah, well, I, and then clock off at like night time. Yeah, but I also I'm working on a system of um, there would be there will be a driven wheel. But it'll be yeah. driven like because there are like basic engineering concepts. So like you push a fucking thing round in circles. Yeah, yeah. Like if you've yeah. ever seen the opening of Conan, where he's pushing the thing round that makes yeah. the mill go or whatever for years. So it would be like you know you would have two men on these like basically these wooden handles that will turn a, a variety of like large gears that, that make them sort yeah. spin. So that once you once you've done the the main manual saw, you can just like mm, just push it through and turn it to planks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> one of the um, one of the best things to do in medieval times, right, was get yourself a cart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because carts, I don't know if you know this, but you could be employed for fucking anything. Yeah, yeah. Even the like undertakers back then, right, would pay people with carts to go pick up the bodies. Yeah, yeah. Bring so they go guys. like, right, this guy's just died in this place. There's some gold. Go pick him up. And you'd go and pick up this body and bring it back, and that's it. Your job's done. Yeah, Boom. yeah. And then you just go to someone else. It'd be like a baker going, "Can you take this to market?" Okay, then. Yeah, yeah. It's like you just spend the entire it, day well, it's, with this it's, fucking car. You love it. <laughs> the modern day equivalent is yeah. the man with a van. Yeah, a white van man. Yeah, it just drives around and does shit for you. you literally put but, an ad in the paper. I've got a van. Yeah. Yeah, anyone want shit doing? <laughs> but it's probably now not as common because back then it's still pretty common. Well, funeral directors couldn't buy a person to do that regularly. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it would basically just be, I'll get a guy with a car to do it, or mm. we'll go carry the fucking thing back. In which case, because they never wanted to touch the body due to disease and things like that and all this business, they used to like go to the house, put the coffin down, pull the covers off with the person on the bed, yeah. so they go in there, wrap them up in the covers, put the coffin case on and take them back. I quite like and the fucking covers. I quite like doing little things like that with the yeah. players as well when it's like, if they make friends with any NPC in a specific place... And it dies. <laughs> and and they, they make it clear that they're going somewhere else quite often. They'll ask them to take something or bring something back because yeah. it's, you know, it's quite a distance. And that is a thing that used to happen quite a mm. lot because people just didn't have the transport and most of the time didn't have the fucking time. Yeah, like, while you're there, work. you can give this letter to yeah. my sister and then it's like, okay, then yeah, cool. And it's, you know, it makes it a little bit more immersive. But then in reality, it's drugs. Oh, it's yeah. just as a drug. <laughs> well, they, they were they were fighting. I had this great little setup of like, as they approached the village of Lumbrell, there'd be this, uh, these bandits who like kidnapped the, um, just this random woman, shot the deputy on their way out and are legging it down the road and they come to a stop. Uh, because the players are blocking the road. 
and uh, the main bandit, Black Ted, he basically threatens them. They've all, because they've got crossbows at the ready sort yeah. of thing, and they're like, one of them is a Goliath, one of the players, and he's like, basically says to the Goliath, that massive hammer you've got there, throw it in the grass. And then I want you all, anything you're holding, throw it into the grass, and I'll step aside so we can go past, and that'll be the end of it sort of thing. But he's also lying, and if they'd yeah. have done that, he would have shot the Goliath <laughs> and then legged it. That was the plan. But they didn't back down, actually, because they'd been quite cowardly so far, so I was like, oh, they're totally going to throw their weapons aside and just stand aside. But they didn't. They actually stood up, which was brilliant. And the Goliath, oh, my God, he charged forward and hit this guy with the Great Hammer, and it's, it does so much damage. <laughs> it didn't even do that good a hit, but it did... After the magic missile hit this guy, he was on like 4 HP, and when the Great Hammer hit him, it did 19 damage. Yeah. Basically knocked him down to minus 15 in a single blow. So I had it like completely cave in his rib cage, send him flying oh. back off the horse. His cowboy hat sort of like floats down on the breeze afterwards. <laughs> and then one of the other guys, like, because there's like three other guys there, the three other bandits, mm. two of them just immediately drop their crossbows, and one of them just wets himself. He's like sat on his <laughs> horse, just pees his pants. <laughs> also. <laughs> have you ever seen Chicken Run? Yeah, I have seen Chicken Because I believe run. the chicken's are trying to get out through the gear. <laughs> oh, right, shit, on towns. Yeah. Watch them. <laughs> Watch the ones by the gear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're slowly pecking. <laughs> slowly pecking. They're slowly time. pecking their way Have you noticed them. the badgers are doing it? Yeah. It's that, it's that <laughs> like, criminal sort of thing where, where you do... The pigs are slowly doing it on the other side. Yeah, the it's because they're spawning one and then getting <laughs> yeah. pushed back. It, it's like spawn and despawn. But it's like it's like those people you get in prison who are digging their way out with a spoon and like takes years. Yeah. There's a great bit in um in this series of books that I've been reading called Malazan Book of the Fallen, where um this is like so called Dragnipur. And if you're hit by Dragnipur, if you're killed by it, you get sucked into the sword. And in there there's like a whole other dimension where it was this cart and it's just like an endless sort of plane yeah. and you've got to keep this cart moving you just got to keep pulling it and tucking it and people have been there so long that like, they've worn their legs down to nubs and stuff and it's really horrible and it's just like a greek titan that's pushing a rock there. yeah a bit like sisyphus but like was it, sisyphus? The, I thought it was prometheus no prometheus was the one who get his liver eaten every day because he stole fire from the I gods and got and and out. The rock. no sisyphus has to push oh, the rock up the slope he has to push the rock up the slope but. and it keeps rolling down that was sisyphus yeah i know um what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, on this car, there's a rogue called Absalar, who's, yeah. like, a, a proper, like, high-level thief. And she's been there for donkey's years. And what she's been doing is, with her chains, she's just been rubbing them together for centuries, just slowly trying to get through the chains. It's smart. brilliant. It's such a smart plan. But she's had to, like, sit there for, like, literally, like, hundreds of years doing this. It pays off in the end. She gets out. <laughs> nice. Right. We're done. We're over time, Valeria. So that series you're going to have to wait till next time. Um, so if you want to say bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye.